Hello, friends, and welcome to the Reclamation Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Colleen Johnson, and I'm here to guide us in raw conversations about thriving in life and work so that together we can step into personal agency and stop letting life happen to us. We'll cover topics like health, boundaries, communication, finances, and worthiness. That badass business you've been dreaming of, it's not so far off. The desire to wake up feeling fully alive, it's right around the corner. All right, there you are. Awesome. Oh, you're sideways. Oh, (laughs) Hold on. Okay. There we go. Cool, cool. Okay. Yay. Awesome. So fun. I'm so excited to have you. Me, I'm excited to be here. Cool. Um, kind of before we get started, um, I'll like let people start joining. I know when you go live, it like takes a little bit. So um thought I'd let everyone know. Angel and I actually already had like most of this conversation already. <laughs> yes. Um, it was so fun. Um we were recording for the podcast, my podcast, and we had some super fun technical difficulties. So we decided, well, why not just hop on Instagram Live and do it there instead? So, yeah. So we will be recording the audio, or I am going to be downloading the audio, and I'll post that as a podcast as well. But we figured, why not go live too? So, yeah, might as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So I'll introduce you real quick. Um, okay. And... Yeah, so Angel and I met. We were sweet mates in college, which was super fun. Um, Angel let me borrow her clothes sometimes, really expanded my horizons with wearing more vibrant colors and patterns. And uh, that was super fun. I love it. You're still into that. You've got your yes. purple hair <laughs> rocking it. <laughs> yes, I love the colors. <laughs> yes, I love it. Um, and you're now a counselor of fin- and a financial advisor. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about for the most part during this live. Mm-hmm. Um, also, just as an FYI angel, they do cut us off like at exactly an hour, like Instagram boots us off. Okay. So we can just kind of be like keeping an eye on the time. Cool. Um, but I think we'll be fine. So, okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, let's just go ahead and dive right into it. I'd love if you can share some of your story and um, kind of part of why for anyone who's listened to my podcast in the past, um, a big part of it is hearing people's stories, hearing what um, the struggles that they've gone through, the journeys that they've gone to to kind of become who they are now. Um, so I'd love if you can kind of share a little bit of your journey and how you came to be um, a financial advisor and a counselor. Sure. Um, so counselor. It really just started in high school. You know, that's where we all try to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up, right? Um, sure. And I had this idea that I really wanted to help people. That was my main goal. I wanted to help people. Um, and so the first way that I thought I would do that would be to advocate for people by becoming a lawyer, right? To be able to defend people, um, fight for just, justice and all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, to my liking or my disliking, I took an AP government class <laughs> and I found out that that was not the road for me at all um, but I was still interested in people and so I was like well how do I still help people and not necessarily in this way and so um, that's when I that's when the epiphany came from like oh I could be a counselor I could help people be one-on-one with yeah. people be able to like get into their stories and help them mm-hmm. um, because I felt like as I was growing up as a child it was one of the things that I Missed. I wish I had gotten into counseling as a child. I had a lot of dysfunction um, in my family, and it was difficult. And I wanted someone. I would want to like be that person that would have been there for me as a child mm-hmm. or an early an adult, teenager, all those things that kind of help me guide myself through life. Um, and so that's really what I that drive that came from being a counselor, being able to just sit alongside people help mm-hmm. them with their stories, help guide them to where they want to be. Um, and yeah. And then when it came to the financial services, we all have money <laughs> and we all don't know what to do with it. Um, but we also have this vision of being well in the future. And mm-hmm. so um, as a young adult, and I'm still a young adult, clearly, but as a teenager and young adult, early in my life, I was afraid with money. Like I had this sense of like, I never want to be broke. Like, I want to, you know, be well off, 
all those things, but I didn't have any direction. And so uh, I've been blessed to have like opportunities of people to come into my life to kind of show me some of those things. And then I've just been part of like the mentorship to be able to learn concepts and kind of get that off the ground. So I want to be able to provide that to other people who are looking and trying to like be better than their family, also be better mm-hmm. for themselves, you know, see a future for themselves. And stuff like yeah. That. Mm-hmm. For sure. Kind of like break those patterns of the past and like be able to kind of start off on a good foot. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and then one of our other primary topics that we're going to be diving into is pretty deep. Um, so we're going to be chatting some about domestic violence because that's something else um, that you have your work in. So kind of before we get started into that, and we'll be talking from the perspective of both uh, victims and perpetrators. But before we dive into that, I do want to just let anybody know who's listening or watching live that if it feels like this might be triggering for you in any way, please just like, you know, bounce off. You can check out some of the other podcast episodes because uh, we want to make sure this is a safe place. Um, and this will be a little bit deeper in like figuring out some of those, having some of those good conversations. So just wanted to put that little nugget in there and I'll let you kind of speak to your work in that now. Sure. So um, I work for a domestic violence agency. It's called The Safe Place. Um, it's located in Lake County, Illinois. Uh, we service all of Lake County and some of the northern parts of Cook County. Um, mm-hmm. In particular, what I get to do or what I have the privilege to do is um, on the survivor side, I am able to work with families who um, have already fled and they're looking for permanent housing along Lake County. And so I help them find housing and then we are able through grants provided by the state and other uh, sources, resources, we are able to help provide a subsidy amount per month to kind of help them get started. Um, and I get to do case management work. I get to see like their growth. Uh, the best part of that side of my job is just seeing the sense of hope when they get their keys, uh, when they get their mm-hmm. first, because a lot of times this is their first home by themselves and independently. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really cool just to see that sense of hope and uh, them being proud of themselves of this new journey that they're taking. And so I really get a pleasure out of that and just seeing like, I can start a new life. Like I can, I can get past my past. Basically. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side, I also have the privilege to work with the abusers, the perpetrators, um, as well. They're not necessarily the same perpetrators that I work with the victim. I really don't know just based off of confidentiality, but I do get to work with the perpetrators. Um, and it's a six month program. It's an intervention program. Um, and majority of the people that are referred there are mandated by court or DCFS. Um, and so I get to see these indivi- these people individually for counseling or in group counseling settings. And uh, we go through different topics, 26 weeks worth of how to dive into healthy relationships, what is violence, what is your history with violence, what's your relationship with violence. Um, mm-hmm. And we really get to tackle those things that are embedded or kind of just learned behaviors of what a relationship looks like and how can you change it and a, a lot of a lot of our focus is more so how do you help how does this person how does the abuser help the next generation stop mm-hmm. violence mm-hmm. so we kind of we it's all about them but a lot of times a lot of people are more more apt to like help someone else than they are to help themselves and so when we talk about um when i speak with the abusers or when i talk about the abuse um it's all about how do I change so that my kids, their kids, can see a difference. So yeah, I really, yeah. I really enjoy that. So I, I, I'm just truly blessed that the job that I get to do, I get to see survivors gain hope, and then mm-hmm. I get to see um, abusers relearn how a relationship, um, how a healthy relationship looks. And so yeah, just that yeah. epiphany that they get is just like. You've got it. Like you can get it. You can teach this. So mm-hmm. I, I love what I do. I love what I do. That's so awesome. I love hearing that. I feel like transformation for all of us is such a big part of like our life. We're kind of all on this ongoing transformation journey. Um, yeah. And when you can actually kind of see that in another person, I feel like it's also really inspiring just for anyone who's around them um, to yeah. see how that can happen. Um, yeah. yeah. 
That's so cool. Yeah, I love it. Um, especially especially when the guys get to teach the other guys. Or yeah. the other people in the group get to teach the other like I and sometimes the group runs itself because mm-hmm. you know, we have people coming in at different different areas or different journeys yeah. of their life, you know, different parts of the group. And some people, you know, get it quicker, some people get it a little bit slower. Mm-hmm. And then when they get to teach their peers, I feel like that's that's when you know you're making you know yeah. the difference. It's kind of like a compounding effect where, you know, it just mm-hmm. kind of like keeps keeps going, which is awesome. It's like switching the old compounding effect and transitioning it into a healthier one. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious uh, what you see to be the root causes of some of these issues, um, just as kind of you're working with people, something that we can just kind of be aware of and, and notice in our own lives um, as well. I know some of these may not be relevant to everyone, but I'd just be curious if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, sure. So when it comes to uh, finances, I feel like the root cause of it is just plain illiteracy. Mm-hmm. We have money. We, we know how to get money, right? Because we go to work, we earn money. But yeah. we don't know what to do with that money afterward. Mm-hmm. So um, we don't know how to invest it. We don't know how money can work for us, what to do. We mostly look for instant gratification and so I feel like there's a lack of literacy when it comes to finances and how Mm -hmm. finances can uh, be a positive for us and have it work for us basically Um, yeah and so on the flip side when it comes to relationships or domestic violence I feel like the root cause of it is just simply being surrounded by unhealthy relationships you know Mm -hmm. we don't see a lot of healthy relationships in the media, in our family, in our, yeah. in, you know, our day to day. So how are we supposed to mimic a healthy relationship if we don't even know what that looks like or we don't yeah. know what that is? Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the finances piece of that, do you see, um, along with illiteracy, do you ever see kind of uh, worthiness having a play in that and how people, if they feel worthy of getting out bigger paycheck and kind of having a, the job that they desire. Do you ever see that kind of playing into things as well? Definitely. I feel like worthiness is like important for any aspect of life. And mm-hmm. you definitely have to know your worth to know that you deserve more at a job, to know that you can have more or even yeah. to even strive or be committed to having more. Right. Mm-hmm. You have to know that you're deserving, suitable, you're important enough to be able to, Set yourself with boundaries, be able to yeah. kind of go after what you want when it comes to financial stability and thriving. For sure, for sure, yeah. Um, with um, we could kind of like switch a little bit, but kind of adding in some of like the cultural things that are happening along with kind of these conversations of transformation and um, becoming more aware of ourselves, I guess. Um, how do you see patriarchy, various form, like forms of supremacy, um, including white supremacy, playing into the role of domestic violence and financial wellness? Sure. So um, in domestic violence, we teach both our survivors and uh, perpetrators about the cycle of violence, right? And mm-hmm. the, and particularly the power and control. Wheel. And so my belief is that this country is built on power and control. It's embedded mm-hmm. into our systems um, and it plays out in everyday life. You see it everywhere, no matter where mm-hmm. you go. And so I feel like it's an underlining and unspoken thing that we don't necessarily talk about. How is how is this country uh, exerting power and control over its people? No mm-hmm. matter the skin color, the gender, whatever those those little details might be, it's just simply there. That's what that's just what America is. It's built mm-hmm. on power and control. Yeah. So, I mean, you see it everywhere. everywhere. For sure. And being in this field, I feel like I see it all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, hi- it's hard to just hide from it. You just are always smacked in the face with, wow, that's exerting mm-hmm. some power. That's exerting some control. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's hard because even, like, we have it in that cultural sphere, but then also just when we have um, a feeling of unsafety or um, just like our fight or flight is activated, the natural tendency is to 
kind of act in a manipulative or controlling way. And it's so hard to like, it's easy to see it around us, but then it's also hard to like, kind of look back at ourselves and be like, okay, like, yes, this is happening outside of us, but what's, what am I doing too when I'm feeling fearful? So, yes, exactly. And I feel like that's, that's the key point when it comes to uh, trying to eliminate that. Is mm-hmm. looking inward. What is triggering you to not have those kinds of people? What's tr- mm-hmm. triggering you to not be a perpetrator of this country's exertion of power and control? Yeah. You have to be aware of those things inside of you in order to have any type of constructive conversation or action that mm-hmm. follows along with that. Yeah, yeah. So kind of we've talked a little bit about why some of this stuff happens. Do you mind speaking to how you see we can kind of take action um, both in your own work, but then also just to anyone who's listening, how they can take action. So you maybe start with how you um, help facilitate change in your clients um, and then kind of how we can also take some steps. Sure. Um, So when it comes to domestic violence, simply providing resources to people, um, getting the word out, letting people know that they have options or there are people and agencies, organizations out there that are willing to help them, whether Mm -hmm. they are uh, a survivor or an abuser. Um, And just having that sense of awareness, right, that something here isn't right on both Mm -hmm. sides. And uh, I think the biggest thing that is lacking is just the finance piece. If we're talking mm-hmm. about organizations helping people to uh, establish healthy relationships, you need money for it, right? And um, just speaking particularly of the organization that I work with, even though we're privileged to have a perpetrator group and intervention mm-hmm. for that, it's the least funded group. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and how, how are we supposed to be catalysts of change if we're not helping those who are per- perpetrating those mm-hmm. things, right? If we don't help those people along their healing journey, we're not going to get that far, right? Yeah. So we need to look on both sides. It's not just mm-hmm. helping the survivors. It's also helping uh, those who are perpetrating the violence to mm-hmm. understand that there's healthier ways, there's better ways, and that we're not going to look at them as monsters, mm-hmm. right? We're not going to stigmatize them as not being able to like get better. There's hope for everyone. Mm-hmm. I tell people all the time, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't think there was hope. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and compassion for people is not limited to a certain type of person. Mm-hmm. Compassion is for everyone. That includes those who are perpetrating these things. And so we have to have compassion for those people and also we got to fund those things. Um, and mm-hmm. So you can help in any way. One is, again, getting the, the resources out there, being a supporter, you know, and also help funding those things or finding ways to help fund those things. Yeah, yeah. I want to circle back a little bit to kind of what you were just talking about, how like the compassion kind of for everyone, um, just because I feel like there's so much within that of there's like, there's hope for everyone. Um, and in that sense, um, at least in my own research and my own growth, I've just recognized so much like when we express ourselves in an unhealthy or an unbeneficial way, it's just these layers of um, programming and conditioning. And so with everyone, we all have the opportunity to kind of slowly peel back these different layers. It takes hard work and it does take resources. And um, often it takes support from others to be able to um, help guide us on that journey. But it's all about um, leaning in to ourselves and like noticing those things. Of Awareness is key. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have anything to kind of add to that process that you that you've noticed or that you kind of uh, think about in your own journey? Uh, can you re- repeat the question? So you're asking. Yeah. So just like any thoughts that you have, kind of around this like deprogramming or unconditioning process. Yeah. So I feel like awareness again is always key. So rather, from my point of view, I work with majority mandated clients. Mm-hmm. So they're forced to forced to be there, right? Um, but we do have some people who are self referred. They just say like, you know, this relationship is not working out. This my partner is telling me that I'm exhibiting X, Y, and Z behaviors, and I'm just here mm-hmm. to figure it out. Like I just want to figure it out. And I think it really just you have to take take note: is this relationship working? Mm-hmm. Am I contributing to this relationship not working? 
Mm-hmm. And then what can I do to kind of, if you're committed to this relationship, if this is the relationship you want, how do I uh, learn some new concepts, learn some new techniques, uh, maybe relearn some new techniques, you know, peel back some of those things that yeah. are kind of having this reactive state instead of mm-hmm. an intense state. Yeah, that's a huge piece of being less reactive and more intentional, just kind of shifting that perspective and allowing ourselves to do that. Yeah, I love that. Okay. Um, can you speak to a little bit more of the financial piece? I know previously when we chatted about this, I found it really cool because um, a lot of times once we're kind of getting to the point where we're really um attracting in the money that we want or working for it like that's more of our like self-actualization phase right Right. but you in order to even get there you really have to start at the base level of your finances and just emotional intelligence and things like that um which for me I've just kind of fallen in love with Maslow's hierarchy of needs that just kind of showcases that in such a tangible way um but I'd love to hear how you kind of utilize that framework, whether it is intended or not, to really help um, people with their finances. So can you just kind of speak to the finances? Sure. Um, So I have the privilege to be able to kind of examine people's finances. So the first thing that we do is we look at income coming in, expenses coming out. And Mm -hmm. the goal is always, always, always to increase income, decrease expenses. Um, And so what we try to do is we eliminate those things that we don't need. So it might be cable, it might be going to Starbucks every day, you know, things like that. You have to reevaluate the things that you actually Mm -hmm. need um, in order to get to the place that you see yourself in the future. Now, those things aren't like forever and permanently banned Mm -hmm. from your life. They're temporarily, you know, set aside so that you can kind of reach for this further goal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we kind of do kind of use the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Like, is it? Something that you need or want, you know, you don't need. Um, also, just also have that specific you don't for that. I feel like awareness, again, is also things like that. You have to reevaluate the things that you actually mm-hmm. need um, in order to get to the place that you see yourself in the future. Now, those yeah. things aren't like forever and permanently banned mm-hmm. from your life. They're temporarily, you know, yeah. set aside so that you can kind of reach for this further goal. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, we kind of do kind of use the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Like, is it something that you need or want? You know, you don't need a Starbucks coffee. If you feel like you need caffeine, you mm-hmm. might just have to make it yourself. You know you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or for me, it might be, you don't need those pair of shoes. You <laughs> have plenty of them at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just evaluating, like, what do you actually need? And mm-hmm. is the thing, I like to tell people, every penny that you have should have a purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so if your purpose, the penny that you're spending doesn't have a purpose that's going to serve you long term, and it's just yeah. instant gratification, you probably need to rethink it. Mm-hmm. Alongside with that is you want to also build like that emergency savings. 87% of Americans today are living paycheck to paycheck. And that just simply, it doesn't matter like how much money you it's not just a mm-hmm. low income problem. Uh, people who are making, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year or more are also living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, um, and it's a sense of not knowing, not having a purpose for their penny, right? We're mm-hmm. just spending money because we have it there, um, and not saving for emergencies that happen. You know, mm-hmm. like most of the majority of Americans can't even pay for a four hundred dollar expense, um, emergency expense. They don't have to say, yeah. um, and so mm-hmm. you really have to be intentional mm-hmm. uh, about where your money's going and how is it going to benefit you not only today but in the future. Yeah. Because eventually, you know, majority of us would like to retire, would like to not, you know, work every day. Um, yeah, there's some people who would still work, but people would like to have the option that I don't have to necessarily go in mm-hmm. in order to, uh, you know, pay bills. You know. And so in order to get to that point, you have to be intentional about your money and how you spend it today. Yeah, yeah. 
That's really good. And those are even just like some practical steps you right there for anyone who's listening that is on that journey to um, it's just what, what was that? It was kind of like a, a good quote from you there. Your penny, every penny has to have its place. Has like to have that. its purpose. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. like its purpose. Mm-hmm. That's really good. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, kind of focusing a little bit more on your journey, um, how, because you're having deep conversations with your life, like, or in your work every day, how do you balance kind of those heavyweight conversations with having a solid personal life? Sure. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> um, I, I do have the, I do have like the blessing to be able to compartmentalize my uh, interactions at work and my interactions at home, you know, mm-hmm. my personal life. Uh, but it still is difficult. Um, one of the things I have to do is set some firm boundaries. So once I mm-hmm. clock out, once, once I say I'm done with work, there's no checking emails, mm-hmm. there's no answering phone calls, um, yeah. none of that. Like I have to set a boundary because I don't want it to spill over. I want to be able to like just pick it up when I come back to work. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because if not, it's just simply a sense of um, not knowing not knowing when to stop thinking about the stories that you hear, mm-hmm. uh, not knowing how they spill over into your personal relationship with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on top of that, I have to also uh, have a sense of release. So that might be taking a walk. Um, that might be taking up boxing every now and then, working mm-hmm. out, writing, drawing, uh, doing something that fulfills me. I have to I have to be very, very aware of what is fulfilling for me at the moment and what's not fulfilling at the moment. So that changes day to day, moment to moment. Working out yesterday might not be the thing today to do mm-hmm. based off the, you know, series of events or stories that I have to hear. Yeah. Um, but then on the other side is being aware of if and when I'm becoming numb to the story. Um, mm-hmm. because I'm I'm surrounded by trauma. In my eight to ten hours of the day, I'm surrounded by trauma. Um, I'm surrounded by some gruesome stories uh, of people who are, you know, being violent. And it's mm-hmm. I, I get the rawness of it. I get the rawness of the survivors crying and mourning over, you know, being in a relationship. Mm-hmm. I get the stories of the abusers uh, regretfully sometimes, you know, perpetrating this violence on the survivors. And I have to be aware of being able to uh, know that if there's there's levels to violence, violence and violence, but mm-hmm. there's a severity to it, and there's a sense of pain that comes along with it. And realize when I'm becoming numb to that, mm-hmm. and so when I am becoming numb to that, I have to reevaluate, acknowledge the severity of each individual story, um, yeah. just to be able to move forward. Because if not, then it's like, oh, it's just, you know, just another abuse or just, you know, just, it was just a thing, you know, mm-hmm. something like that. I have to be aware that these are, I hear all the time, it becomes normal, but mm-hmm. it's not normal. Yeah. <laughs> it's not normal. Yeah, for sure. That's, um, it's again, kind of going back to that, like mindfulness and noticing, yeah. like, what are we creating as normal in our own brains? and for you, that's obviously a very intense piece where, you know, you're surrounded by trauma all the time um, and in, in violence. Um, but just even in our in our everyday lives, no matter what people experience in their workplace, they can kind of take a step back sometimes and just mm-hmm. notice like, well, is this person's words like it's, you know, this is not a healthy environment that I'm in at work, but right. am I making that normal? Am I allowing that to be normal? And then right. I'm taking that home with me like. Exactly. That kind of thing. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Um, for Because we're kind of on that um, domestic violence piece, for anyone who is currently um, in a position in a position where maybe they're experiencing some domestic violence or they have seen it um, starting to manifest in their family, uh, do you have any recommendations for them or resources that uh, they can be aware of? Sure. So for anyone who's experiencing domestic violence, um, I, the first thing you can do is call the hotline. 
The hotline number is 1-877-2NDV. 1-877-2NDV. Um, you can call that and you can get many resources that are in your area, in your county, in your state. Um, but also, you have to be aware that this is not, you know, awareness is a huge key. You have to be aware that this is not a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be aware of the red flags. Is this person um, being verbally aggressive? Are they, you know, being sexually aggressive? Are they supportive? You know, do they respect my boundary? Uh, are they able to communicate effectively that doesn't, you know, disrespect each other? You know, what are those red flags for you? And what are those red flags that tell you that this is not, I should probably reevaluate this. Um, so that would be the first step. And then also the second step would be knowing that you have options. You, you don't have to uh, be in that situation. You have options. There are many reasons that people stay in a uh, violent relationship, healthy relationship, uh, whether it be for love, for kids, for economic reasons. So you have options and there are we are resources out there that can help, um, that you don't have to feel stuck, you don't have to feel trapped. Um, mm -hmm. So those would be my, my two things that I would say. Call the hotline, be aware of what those red flags are, and know that you have options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also just for anyone who's in maybe a situation who, perhaps it's not domestic violence, um, but maybe it's more of a, <clears throat> like, like mind games, um, that would play. I feel like those are s seemingly, um, similar where maybe it's you're saying stuff. Violence. Yeah, it's all, okay, it, so that's all domestic violence. Domestic okay. violence covers physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, mental and psychological, economic, um, mm. they, they use children as a manipulator, all those things. This domestic violence. A lot of times, mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. Because yeah, no, that's great so, because that's how we think of domestic <laughs> violence. We only think of like the bruises that people leave. Yeah, it's not the bruises that people leave. It's the interaction in the relationships, whether it is physical mm -hmm. or verbal. Mm -hmm. You know, emotional. Those are all domestic violence. They're one and the same. They're equal. The only thing is. When it comes to society and charging people, people charge based off the bruises that you can see. Mm -hmm. Honestly, uh, emotional abuse causes more damage than a physical, like someone getting hit, someone being mm -hmm. beaten. I mean, there's, when you are being beaten, I'm not going to invalidate that, by the way, mm -hmm. but when you are, get, there's also an emotional and psychological process. And so that scarring takes a little bit longer to heal. Mm -hmm. But those are all. It all funds, uh, all falls under the umbrella of domestic violence. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. That's mm -hmm. really helpful. Um, and do you have any kind of, we've talked about this in context of relationships or um, kind of romantic relationships specifically. Um, do you have any ideas or um, kind of thoughts you could speak to people that maybe they're in a situation where it's with a friend or a coworker, um, or maybe their just work environment isn't that healthy, that they could just start to take te steps um, in setting boundaries and things like that? Do you have thoughts kind of for that person? Sure. Um, I would say, I think it just goes with setting boundaries um, and then going, if that person doesn't respect their boundaries, you have to, going back to that worthiness. You have to know that mm. you're worth the boundaries that you're setting. And if the mm. person does not respect those boundaries, then you have to remove yourself. You have to mm. you have to remove yourself. You have to because people are only gonna going to do to you what you tolerate from them, right? And mm. if you're tolerating those things, you're telling them it's okay. Yeah. It's okay for you to step over my boundaries. It's okay if I tell you I don't like this, but you continue to do that. You have to know that I am I am deserving of the boundaries that I'm setting in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot. It's not easy. It's it's easy to say, but it's difficult to put in action. And so yeah. and so it's, it's just difficult to put that in action. And so what you have to do is just kind of going back to that working is I am worthy of this. I can do this. Like I I can it might be painful to mm -hmm. set some distance between that work environment. It might be mm -hmm. difficult to set some distance between that friend or that coworker, but mm -hmm. I need this because it's not fulfilling to me. Yeah. It's not, it's not being healthy for me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not growing in this state. For sure. Yeah. And 
at least in my experience from what I've seen um, and my own personal experience, the more you set those healthy boundaries and allow yourself to recognize that you are worthy and you like set, separate that, you create that distance from those poor relationships. No worries. <laughs> um, the more the more healthy you do become and you start to actually find yourself in those healthier environments and in those healthier relationships. Because again, you're setting those boundaries. You're saying, no, like I am worth more than that. I, yeah. I deserve more than that. And then it allows, um, it allows space. So you actually can kind of call in those healthier relationships. Yes, yes, exactly. It calls in that space. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we don't, I tell people, if you're already, you're full on with this unhealthy relationship, you're not able to see what's healthy. You know, you mm. have to, you do, you have to create that space. If yeah. you don't have the space, it's not going to come. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, that's so good. I love that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so good. Um, okay. So for, um, I'd love to have you speak to, if anyone, <laughs> you're popular. <laughs> oh no, this has never happened. <laughs> That's always what happens, right? You like, right? It's the one time, <laughs> one time people call. <laughs> no worries. All right, I'm there. Cool, cool. Um, I'd love to have you speak a little bit too, because we've kind of covered a lot on both sides of things, like some of your story, some of what you do, some of um, some practical tips for people. Um, but I'd love if you could speak to if someone wants to become a financial coach or if someone wants to become a counselor. Um, some steps or recommendations you have for them, um, whether it's like actually going to get an education or if they just want to like dip their toes in to see if it's a good fit. Um, so I don't know if you have thoughts um, for that. Um, for anyone, I think the first thing, first and foremost, is just knowing that uh, you're you're capable of doing those things and that you're worthy of doing those things. So no matter what your background comes from, no matter what you've learned in the past, no matter what you've experienced in those past, if those are the things that you want to go after, go after them, right? We create our own future. Um, and then being able to connect with mentors and resources that help educate yourself. Um, help getting, you can easily volunteer when it comes to mental health or just social services, you can easily volunteer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, another way that you can do that is uh, for financial services or in social services is just being able to hear what's going on, hear like the different concepts. So yeah. use social media a lot. So you can follow places or follow people that, uh, you know, are talking about relationship, talking mm-hmm. about finances, talking about, you know, societal things. Just being surrounded, surround yourself with it. Surround yeah. yourself with those people and with those conversations. That's great. Awesome. Um, kind of as you were stepping into this role as a counselor and a financial um, advisor, um, what, who are some of your favorite role models or mindset expanders for you? Kind of because you even mentioned that um, you kind of started in one place, you wanted to be a lawyer and then you shifted gears. So who are some of the mindset expanders that really like helped you envision yourself and kind of step into that role? Um, so mindsetters, I think definitely a role model I have is one of my old supervisors when I was becoming a counselor. Mm -hmm. Um, the one thing that she taught me is that being professional, being a counselor doesn't mean that I have to change anything about myself because that's Mm -hmm. the valuable part, valuable part about being a counselor is coming as I am today with my purple hair and funky outfit. Yeah. Um, and being able to present myself to people in a way that can help them um, and also just, you know, being alongside their journey. So I feel like that mm-hmm. was definitely, that was one of those aha moments I had uh, just in my my journey as a counselor. It's like, you mm-hmm. don't have to change anything about yourself. Uh, you come with your knowledge and you're able to, you know, help people from where you are. Yeah. Um, and then I would also say I follow uh, Lewis House. Uh, because he just brings in so many people from all different realms of life, all different mm-hmm. studies and uh, expertise, whether it's health, exercise, uh, relationships, finances, business, all those things. Um, and he has them talk to, you know, have a conversation just kind of like you and I. Mm-hmm. And you get to kind of get a sense of all these different aspects of life and take nuggets from the people who are doing it well. 
So I really mm-hmm. like that as well. And then um, cool. just my own financial coach, uh, she's helped me a lot, not only with my own finances, but teaching me how to teach mm-hmm. this to other people. Um, so those would be my, my three role models or people that I look up to or grab information from. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, kind of as we're, we're starting to like culminate things here and wrap things up. I'm curious, how do you start your morning? What does your morning routine look like? Yes, my morning routine. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I wake up, I wake up quite early. I don't know if it's early for everyone, but I wake up at like five. Um, and so, that's early. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's early. I wake up about five. Um, I do devotions, uh, meditate, pray. Uh, I also try to get a workout in just to build up some of those endorphins. Um, and then I also have a morning call uh, with a, a bunch of other financial coaches. Well, uh, with a bunch of other financial coaches as well that kind of talk about how how to keep motivated and being an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. being able mm-hmm. to you know, keep your business going, what are some things that they've learned, what are some things that they're lacking, just things like that. And yeah. So that's every morning. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Everyone <laughs> just calls me. I've never had this happen before. <laughs> no, it's awesome. It's real life, right? We're Real we're, life. Real life. <laughs> My dog um, barked a couple minutes ago, so <laughs> we're in it together. <laughs> that's okay. Um, and so, yeah, I have conversations with them every morning with about 25 of us each morning. That's and we awesome. talk for like 20 minutes, that's about it. And then mm-hmm. we go about our day. But it's a good way to kind of get my head focused on like what I want to achieve for the day. Um, mm-hmm. And then I also just try to set a plan. What are my goals for the day? What do I mm-hmm. plan to accomplish? Uh, both work and personal and go after them. Because I, I heard this really great quote and I, I now, because it's only been like a month and a half since I heard it, I'm trying to live by, it. you know, set Make sure that you set goals for your day and don't allow like the situations and the turmoil of the day mm. kind of dictate how you act. And so, yeah. you know, you want to be goal driven, be mm. able to be able to get things done, be able to, you know, make progress towards whatever your ultimate goal is. Don't mm. allow your experiences of the day dictate. Yeah, how for sure. So, my one of my um, or my life coach, one of my favorite quotes from her is life is going to life. Where it's just like life is gonna life, that's gonna happen. You still have personal agency, like you still have control over yourself. You can go for your goal and just know that life's gonna do its thing. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We don't get like way, you know, unwavered by life Mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. So that's sorry, I interrupted you though. No, that was good. Mm -mm. No, you said it perfectly. That's exactly what it is. (laughs) <laughs> awesome that's so cool I love it I always think it's interesting to hear how people start their morning like we all have to kind of tap into what works for us um yeah. but it is interesting just to kind of hear the nuances of how people kind of make their morning uh yeah. work for them and set up their day in a positive yeah. way so yeah. yeah um so another question for you just on your journey as a coach and a counselor um what's one way that you do lean in when life does its thing when things get difficult and just like things are thrown at you. Sure. Um, I think the only way that you can do that is you just have to lean in. You just have to know that Mm -hmm. adversity is not, it's not an enemy, right? Adversity is there to help you. So uh, you have to be aware that there's a lesson in every adversity. Um, So I I reluctantly sometimes look forward to those adversities. um, And I try to learn from them as -hmm. much as I can. Try to learn from those things because that's the only way that I'm going to get better because adversity is going to come. Yeah. And sometimes if you ain't learned it the first time, it's going to come again in the same form. <laughs> and so I want to be prepared for when it does come, you know, by yeah. learning from the current adversity, from the past adversity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it's, and so, yeah, you just have to lean in. You have to uh, kind of distance yourself from the adversity. The adversity is not you. Mm-hmm. You're just walking through it. And so knowing that, that you're separate from what's happening to you, gives you a little bit more freedom and power to kind of yeah. push through. Mm-hmm. That's really good. I like that last little piece. Um, you're different from what's happening to you. Mm-hmm. Like that's really solid. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Um, any kind of thoughts? I, I have a couple of final questions for you, but any like thoughts you want to like circle back on or that you like, maybe like 
we're like, oh, I thought of this other thing kind of as we've been talking. Um, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just a person of like, this, it's been like a journey for me of just knowing work and just intentionality. Mm-hmm. I really think that is like the driving force in whatever we pursue. Like yeah. just knowing that we're worthy of something, whether mm-hmm. it is financial stability and thriving, whether it's in relationships, whether it's, you know, at a job, uh, yeah. whether it's starting a business, just knowing that you are deserving of the dreams that you've dreamt. And I mm-hmm. feel like um, I was having this conversation yesterday, actually. I was, I feel like in society, we have forgotten how to dream. You know, mm-hmm. we have come to this sense of like complacency. We're fine with where we are. We shouldn't be fine with where we are. We should always be growing. We should be in a state of learning, yeah. in a state of stretching, because we're humans. We've been, you know, uh, we've been. <laughs> I swear, I don't know what's going on. Uh, we, we're made to evolve, right? We're not made yeah. to be complacent. We're not made to just yeah. sit still. We're made to move forward. And so uh, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with dreaming. And there's nothing wrong with mm-hmm. going after those dreams because you dreamt them for a reason. They can be yeah. reality. You just have yeah. to be committed to the dream and not just interested in it. You mm-hmm. have to be committed. You have to know that whatever it takes, I'm going to make sure this dream happens becomes reality mm-hmm. and then yeah. once that does happen dream bigger have mm-hmm. another dream you know it never yeah. stops and so just knowing that you know you're worthy of having a dream and actually mm-hmm. accomplishing those dreams is like essential wherever yeah are. yeah that's so good I feel like that's just kind of the key to really all we've been talking about is just yeah we are all worthy as human beings. Like we are worthy of the dreams that we're dreaming. We are worthy of the better life that we're pursuing. And it's not always easy to achieve the goals that we desire and the dreams that we're having, but that's part of the journey. And that's part of where we actually start to stand in our worth in new ways that we didn't even know were possible. Um, Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. That was a great great ending I couldn't end things any better (laughs) um so then just to wrap up how can we find you online sure uh so you can find me on instagram natural underscore kawaii um you can also find me on facebook angel arnold um and you can also reach out to me in any of those realms dm me ask me questions if you need help with anything uh, Mm -hmm. with financial services we offer them for free because we really do feel like that literacy is the gap. And so mm. you don't have to worry about any type of payment. I can give you all the knowledge because that's what I want to do. <laughs> give everyone all the knowledge when it comes to financial services and just reaching and thriving for better. If it comes to relationships and healthy relationships, reach out to me. If you have, if you know someone who might be experiencing uh, domestic violence, reach out to me. If you're experiencing domestic violence, reach out to me and I can give resources. Um, but yeah, I am available. Please have conversation with me. <laughs> yeah, everyone, go for it. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna flood your DMs. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love it. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. And look at we like made it in the allotted Instagram time for the live. That's yes. awesome. Didn't get cut off, and it was successful compared to our awesome. last conversation. Yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> so for those of you who are still live or listening, um, I highly recommend if you didn't listen to the whole conversation to kind of go back and listen to the beginning. We covered a lot, kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, so I highly recommend kind of going back and listening. We're just about to wrap up. And um yeah go ahead and reach out to angel and uh, i just want to thank you again for being here and for spending no time with thank you this so great. much for having me this is yeah great. i, love, I it. love it yeah so good awesome all right well i'm gonna end the live and download our audio and put it up on the podcast too so. all, right. all right awesome thanks angel thank you bye, bye. thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the reclamation podcast I hope it served you on your own reclamation journey and know that I'm rooting for you all the way. If you want to learn more about the show guests, head to the website, thereclamationpodcast.com. And if you found value in the show, five stars is always appreciated. Good things are coming for you. Bye for now.